Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me. My name is Evan Radisic. I'm the Managing Director of the Cloud Software Association. Uh, today with me, I have Eugene Krimkevich uh, from ONA. Um, Eugene has been around the block. Uh, he's been in the partnerships discipline industry for over 10 years. Uh, he's worked with companies like Chegg, MindBody, Envision, and obviously now ONA. Uh, in a lot of those companies, obviously, some you started a, a, a you know a program from scratch, and some of them you've just inherited a, a young program. So Eugene's going to take us through kind of his approach for the first 90 days of getting into a role or getting into a you know quote unquote partner program. Um, I won't get in too deep into it. Uh, Eugene, I'm going to pass it on to you, do a quick little intro, and then we'll kind of go from there. If anybody has any questions, please jump in. Let's make this as interactive as possible. And if there's any takeaways, we can take it in the Slack. So uh, Eugene, take it away. Yeah, thank you for the handoff. Um, I think the the intro did more than uh, more than enough justice there. But yeah, I've I've been um, leading partnerships for a little over ten years now, and I think um, I'm really excited to chat about this topic just because, uh, regardless of the industry you're in or the type of partnership that you run, um, it's a very relatable feeling to be new in a role or in a company or a partner program, and have this feeling of like wanting to make impact in your your first ninety days, but um, also, not trying to rush it and really making sure that you have um, the right foundation to make some strategic decisions off of. So um, what I'll walk through today is um, a framework that I've developed over my time doing this. Um, it's a framework that I've used in the past and, and still use and have actually used in my first 90 days here at ONA. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through what that framework is in the context of an actual um, partnership program that I relaunched at a prior company I was at. Um, it's an agency partner program, but we don't have to dive into agency partnership specifics. Um, for one, it's it's not necessarily my strong suit, but the goal here is really to cover like a repeatable and um, and really successful methodology that you can use time and time again, regardless of program and industry and um, and apply in, in, in your situation. And we'll echo what um, Evan said. If you guys have um, questions, jump in in real time. Don't we'll have plenty of time for Q and A at the end, I'm sure, but. Um, would love if this is interactive and um, selfishly would love to learn <laughs> as part of my own masterclass. So um, if you guys have experiences that um, mirror some of this or even contradict some of this, if you have um, advice which is not square with, with what I'm saying, would love to hear that because this is definitely um, not a hard and fast rule for how to do it. It's just the way that, that I've developed um, and found some success with. So let me share my screen here. Let me know if anybody cannot see this. Um, but this is what we'll talk about, um, how to get your partner program on track in your first 90. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll talk about this in the context of an agency program that I relaunched. One of the things that may differ here um, for different people on the call is, um, depending on how mature your program is and how well or not well it's doing, um, some of these steps may take longer um, or, or not as long, depending on what situation you're in. Um, in my case, I was relaunching a program um, that was not doing as well and was not very mature. So I ended up doing a lot of this from scratch, which is why it tends to be um, so detail oriented and intensive. Um, in your cases, you might be able to check the box on a lot of these steps pretty quickly. So um, you can take some of that with a grain of salt. But let me set the stage here with um, with a scenario that I was dealt. So um, at the prior company I was at, um, two years before I took the program on, um, we had launched an agency partner program and we launched it in tandem with a new product category. So not just a new product, but a new category that um, we felt we were thought leaders on. And the idea behind launching that program was um, essentially using agencies as, as force multipliers to be brand advocates, product advocates, et cetera. Um, and at the time that the program was launched, um, it did have a dedicated partnerships lead attached to it. Um, the partnerships lead at, or the, the partnerships team at this company was uh, was somewhat unusual in that we each had very distinct areas of partner responsibility with almost no crossover. So I actually had very little idea of what the agency partnership lead was working on, which will, will come into play later. Um, but my area was really more focused on um, tech and product and strategic partnerships. We had an agency program lead. We had a community program lead. Um, so very little crossover between those two and everyone is kind of in their own lane. Um, fast forward two years when I start to take the program on, the partnerships team gets reorged. 
And at this point, the agency program has gone through two partnership leads that have come and gone. So there's actually nobody who's currently running the program. And it's sitting in the solutions team. Um, and I'm also sitting in the solutions team, which we won't get into why a partnerships person is sitting in the solutions team, but um, that's the the hand that I was dealt. And so um, I had a sit down with my new manager, new team, new program. And um, he basically said like, hey, you're a partnerships guy. Um, we've been running this uh, with a skeleton crew. It really deserves um, more thoughtful attention to understand kind of what's going on and what we should be doing with it. Um, take a look and let me know what you think. So that kind of helps um, set the stage. And, and at this point, like I said, um, I have very little visibility from the prior partnership leads about what the program entailed. So all I really know at this point when I'm having the conversation is we have a few dozen partners in this program at varying stages. Some are onboarding, some have been certified. Um, and that's pretty much the base level of knowledge that, that I'm going off of. So this is the, the plan of attack and the framework that I used for, for this relaunch specifically and that I will tend to use um, really for any partner program or even like a specific partnership, if it's a larger, more strategic partnership um, that has a lot of these elements at play. Um, the first step is going to be the state of the union, which we'll talk about. But um, before we do that, I'll talk about a foundational assumption that I made um, that was somewhat specific to my case, but is actually really helpful to make, um, even if you're running a mature program that um, doesn't necessarily um, need that kind of an assumption. And I'll, I'll talk about what that is. And then we'll talk about some table stakes pieces around defining success and sizing the opportunity for the program. And all of that work basically, basically culminates into um, your thesis. And um, I've, I've deliberately called it a thesis and not a recommendation. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about um, the difference I see there and why I tend to lean towards um, a, a thesis approach, especially in this case. And then the next two steps are, are pretty obvious. It's getting aligned and then actually going out and doing um, what you've defined here. But the first thing I'll talk about is the foundational assumption, um, which is a little unique. And um, the assumption is this, it's, it's don't assume the program needs to exist. So um, in my case, this was a really important assumption to make because uh, some of the context I laid out was the program was not that successful. It, it had kind of flown under the radar for a while. And it's really tempting in a new partner program, whether it's doing well or not so well, to kind of dive right in and start diagnosing a lot of what I call like tactical gaps, um, which like as a partnerships person, you're thinking about like what go to market loops do we have for the partnership? What do partner tiers look like? Um, who is our ideal partner for this? Like what kind of revenue has it generated? Um, so it can be really temp tempting to get tactical very early, but by assuming that the program may not actually need to be here at all, um, you broaden your picture a little bit in terms of the kinds of questions that you might think to ask during the state of a union. So again, in my case, this was, this was really helpful. Um, it's also a little disconcerting to ask because your job is somewhat justified by the existence of that program. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, you may be coming in and running a mature program that's doing quite well. You don't necessarily need to challenge upfront whether that program should, should exist, but um, viewing the world from this lens does just get, give you a little bit of a broader and more strategic view of, of the world. So with that assumption set in place, um, the first thing that I always do is a state of a union, which probably sounds pretty obvious. Um, what may probably surprise some folks here or not is uh, this is where I spend almost like I, I would guess 50% of my time in the first 90 days is really getting um, really tight on what the state of the union for the partner program looks like. And what you're really trying to answer at this stage is, um, it is a pretty simple question on its face. It's where are we now and how did we get here? Um, that's really what you're trying to figure out. And this is not an exhaustive list of questions that you would, you would go through, but you're really trying to understand things like, um, why do we start the program in the first place? And at a more mature company, that reason might be a given. It might be very obvious. Um, but at a younger startup or um, a company that's generally kind of newer to partnerships, um, there might be good reason to question uh, kind of along the lines of that foundational assumption why the program was started in the first place. Um, sometimes companies will start partner programs because they think they should and not because they're trying to solve like a real problem. Um, so that's really important to understand if, if the company started it for the right reason. Um, how was success defined um, or was it even defined? And I'll talk about in our case um, where that wasn't really the case. So that was one of the big flags. 
Um, is the program successful? Um, again, that question might be really easy to answer or not. Um, you might have to jump through some hoops to really understand what success means if it's loosely defined. And then the stuff that might be more obvious that I think we've we've all probably touched in our first 90 days in a, in a role is um, really like the program elements, right? Um, understanding the tiering, what it's like to onboard a partner, the go-to-market loops that you have, um, what other teams the, the partner program works with or needs support from. And then also obviously the, the partner landscape and, and the pipeline. So uh, getting a sense of who your best partners are um, and also understanding if you understand um, who your ideal partners are. And your best partner may not necessarily be your ideal partner uh, because partner programs um, aren't always run by design in that way. So um, again, not an exhaustive list of questions, but these are really the kinds of things that, um, that I will try to think through in the first 90. Um, some of the challenges that uh, I will typically run into and definitely run into with this agency program situation was just having very limited historical context for figuring these things out. Um, if you don't have the people who used to run the program to lean on, um, what you're really forced to do is either triangulate information from other teams. So you're going um, to marketing, you're going to execs that may have touched that program, um, you're going to the product team if that's relevant, and basically trying to figure out like all the little puzzle pieces that you have to piece together, um, which can be a frustrating process, but like unfortunately that is sometimes what it is. So um, triangulating information as best you can from other teams. And then the other thing that you kind of have the luxury of doing because you're new is you can survey your partners um, and try to get good feedback from them in terms of like, you can kind of play dumb and just say like, look, I'm new here. Um, I'm trying to take stock of where we're at and what our programs look like and whether um, whether you're finding success in, in what this program offers. So um, you can ask some pretty good pointed questions to partners and because you're new, um, they will generally give you some leeway and, and try to share. Um, that's assuming your partners aren't like aren't pissed at you, which which hopefully you're not in that situation. Um, and and I was not like even though the program um, was not doing that great, um, partners were still really big brand advocates for for the company. So um, in general, like even though the relationships were not productive from a go to market standpoint, um, they were still pretty decent relationships. Um, the other thing I'll call out here is uh, something I alluded to before, which is trying not to get sidetracked with um, pinpointing like all the tactical gaps and deficiencies. You'll definitely notice those things really quickly, just given that um, you have like a partnerships lens on this world. But um, what I would recommend and what I try to do is I notice those things and note them down, but I put them in a parking lot and I try not to get, um, not to get in the mindset of confirmation bias where like I can see there's clear deficiencies in how the program is being run. But you don't automatically want to assume that like that's why the, the program is failing or that's why the program needs to, to be optimized. And then um, the last thing I'll, I'll offer here is um, this concept of being a zero. Um, so this is actually something I got from a really great book that I, I highly recommend. It's called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth by Chris Hatfield. Um, he's a former Canadian astronaut and he did a couple of tours on the, the International Space Station. So he talks about this concept of being a zero where he's basically showing up for like day one of work in space on the International Space Station. And you're stuck with people for six months. Um, it's a high consequence environment. So the things that you do in your first 90 days to get familiar are, are, are really important. And in terms of being a zero, like a lot of people, myself included, will tend to try and be a plus one. Like the, the natural tendency is to add value immediately in a big way. Um, and if you don't really know what the world looks like and why things are being done the way they are, um, you can actually make things worse by by trying to be a plus one out of the gate. So his advice is don't try to be a plus one. By the same token, don't be a minus one, right? Don't go in and just like start breaking things and making careless mistakes. The idea of being a zero is you come in and you obviously help where you where it's clear that help is needed. But for the most part, you're really just giving yourself um, giving yourself space to observe and um, absorb, right? You're really just trying to get a state of a union and almost like a like a third party consultant, right? Imagine you don't even work for the company, right? You're just a third party consultant, you're detached from the problem and you're really just trying to figure out like why we are where we are. So that's the goal of a state of a union. Um, like I said, this is where I probably spend 50% of my time. It, it's not all you're doing in your first 90 days, but um, it really, really pays dividends in my experience to not rush this part, um, not dive into tactical gaps, and really try to focus like from a strategic lens of, of how you ended up there. 
So to really quickly walk through the abbreviated State of the Union um, that I had for this partner program, I think the actual State of the Union was like a 20 slide deck. So it, it'll be it'll be a lot longer than this. But in terms of why we started the program, I mentioned this before, but it was to support and scale awareness of a, a new product category that we had launched. Um, the biggest flag that came up uh, really early in evaluating the program was figuring out how success was defined. And what I figured out pretty quickly was it wasn't. Um, there was no clear idea of what metric, um, what single metric or what set of metrics um, this program and the team that ran it was accountable for, which um, if you haven't defined that, you've kind of failed out of the gate. Um, so that was where I focused um, pretty heavily in the beginning. In terms of program elements, um, we don't need to dive into this in detail since it's it's agency specific, but um, we check the boxes on most of the things that you would expect to see for kind of a table stakes agency program. There were partner tiers. There was um, some idea of enablement and certification. Um, the one big missing piece was there were no go-to-market motions or go-to-market loops defined with partners. Um, and that was why the partnerships were not, were not particularly productive for either side. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then in terms of partner landscape, um, we had about 30 partners in the program, all at different stages. Some were onboarding, some had already certified, and we're kind of just like sitting around and didn't really know what to do. Um, we had some sense of a partner plan, but um, there was not really any joint accountability or execution on those. And then the most important thing was we didn't have um, an IPP, an ideal partner profile. Um, we had small agencies for the most part that were part of that program. Um, but what I learned was that was not by design. That was just kind of what ended up filtering into the program. So um, that was also an area where I spent a good chunk of time. Um, so with a with state of a union set, like assuming you've done really good groundwork there and you've done some rigorous evaluation, um, the next step is going to be a, a pretty obvious one and one that you may actually not really need to do if you're taking over a mature program where success is very clear. You have historical benchmarks for what that is. You have growth targets. Um, these things you will probably be able to check the box on. But if you're if you're spinning up a new program or you're trying to relaunch one, um, this is a really important area to nail. Um, and in my case, uh, what I didn't want to do was um, overcomplicate success for not just for me, but for how the rest of a company would understand the program because. One of the challenges you'll run into here is um, if you're taking over a program that has already kind of petered out, um, there's a little bit of like a credibility and distraction challenge of like, we try this, like it didn't work. Um, like, why are, why are we doing this again, really? And if you can nail in a single metric um, what it means for that program to succeed, that makes it a lot easier for people to digest um, what you're trying to accomplish and, and why you're doing it. So. Um, in our case, uh, we used a very simple principle for deciding what that was, which is really not a bad um, not a bad rule of thumb for any partner program. And in our case, that was partner sourced um, partner sourced pipeline or partner sourced revenue. And the great fear that obviously any partnerships person has is feeling like you're a cost center of the organization or being perceived like you're a cost center. Um, so it was really important to me out of a gate that if we were going to relaunch the program, we could very quickly point to the fact that this is not a cost center, we're running it in a very lean way, and it's actually generating revenue for, for the company. So out of a gate, that was what we defined as, um, as the North Star for the program. And then one of the bigger challenges though was um, we didn't have internal benchmarks for like how big that number should be. Um, again, because it wasn't tracked, success wasn't defined. Nobody had bothered to figure out um, like, should this be a thousand dollars? Should it be a million dollars? Something in between. And what I ended up doing here was leading on external benchmarks. So um, much the same way that we're having this session and, and sharing information, um, partnerships folks are, are pretty friendly and they, they tend to be willing to share, um, share what their program looks like. And so what I did was I actually reached out to a few folks who I knew were running agency programs, um, one of whom had actually just publicly launched their program. Um, and that was probably the most useful person to chat with just because we were in such a similar situation of really deciding like if we wanted to go down this path again. Um, and so I kind of asked like, why, why did you guys decide to do this? What was the impetus for it? And how they're measuring success and, and what their benchmark was and basically managed to triangulate at least like this is a very small sample size, but for the, the three partners that I talked to, um, they mentioned something in the range of like 10 to 15% um, of our new business is coming from our agency channel. And it was a steady state agency channel. So um, that was the number that I was able to back into 
again, like it's not going to be perfect and it may not be completely analogous to your company or industry or situation, but um, it's better than not having anything and just kind of taking a guess. So um, that was how I, I ended up triangulating. Um, one of the challenges that you'll anticipate um, is like, again, not having those internal benchmarks. So lean on external benchmarks if you can. Reach out to people in CSA, reach out to other folks you know. Some of this is published in case studies, so you can find it that way. Um, the other thing that does often come up is um, it can be tempting to have a lot more than one success metric, especially when you've gone through a state of the union and you've identified a ton of different tactical gaps that, um, that you feel the need to like measure and improve. Um, what I would say is think of those as like secondary health metrics for your program, but everything should really roll up to like the one, the one health metric that um, you really want to track and report out on. So um, that's how I would, I would tend to try and handle that challenge. Um, so you've got your state of the union, you've defined success. The next step is really a follow on on the success definition. And that is sizing, like how big the success should be. So in our case, we have partner source revenue as a success metric. Um, how much partner source revenue should should we be generating? And in our case, the, the whole point of this exercise is really deciding, along with that foundational assumption that we made, um, is this really big enough to matter and should we go down this path? Um, if you're running Salesforce App Exchange, you probably don't need to ask the question of like, is this big enough to matter? Um, you can take for granted that it is. But um, in our case, this was something we had to model out. So um, this was also until I got from the partner folks I chatted with that ran their agency programs. Um, Two of them both said that they started out their program with their agency customers. So they had um, customers that were using their product. They were also consulting on their clients uh, on that product. And so they used that as a pipeline foundation, um, which luckily we had data on. We actually marked who our agency customers were in Salesforce. So we pulled that list, decided that would be the foundation for a building pipe, um, pipeline here, and then built um, a scenario model. And the idea behind a scenario model is um, you give folks a range instead of like a number that you're forecasting against. And the range is really like worst average best. Um, I find that that's really helpful because if you're presenting a single number, um, it's easy for someone to challenge you on that's either too aggressive and here's why, or I think you're sandbagging and here's why. But when you present the range, it's a little easier um, to understand relatively speaking what it means to be aggressive versus conservative and what the in-between looks like. Um, so I, I, I always or almost always will use um, scenario models, especially in cases where I just don't have a lot of data to go off of and um, I don't have hard assumptions or precedents that I can really make for, um, for how the model should be built. So uh, that's why the scenario model was built that way. We did have some anecdotal evidence um, from the, like the couple dozen partners we had onboarded about um, how many of those actually end up getting certified, what that par partner funnel looks like. Um, so that was what the model was was essentially built off of. And the way we did it, because we had the top line number from, you know, what does 10 to 15 percent of our um, of our new business look like? We were able to back into assumptions and basically gut check those. So to get to that 10 to 15 percent number, you have a good sense of how many partners you need to sign, um, what the average deal size should be, how many deals they should be bringing you every month. And you can basically check, like, is that a realistic number? Um, and if it's not. Uh, either the implication is um, you need resourcing to get to that number and you need to make a decision about um, do we want to invest in that resourcing or not? Um, or the implication is it goes back to the assumption you made in the beginning, which is if you don't think you can make realistic assumptions that get you there, you need to ask the hard question of like, should this program exist? Should we kill this off or pause it? Um, so in our case, it was big enough to matter. The assumptions were reasonable enough that we felt like we could do it on, on pretty lean resourcing. Um, one thing I'll mention about the big enough to matter question, um, it should always kind of take an ROI lens into account. And what I mean by that is just as a hypothetical, right? Like 500K of partner sourced revenue for your company in the grand scheme of things, it might not be that much. Um, but if you're getting that incremental 500K with like 10% of your time, um, that may very well be worth it. So don't just focus on like what the high level revenue number is, but how many resources you're actually investing to get there. And if, if the resourcing is minimal and you're getting incremental revenue, then that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
So you've done all this hard work. You've spent a ton of time on your state of a union. You have really clear success definitions. You built these great scenario models that are really detailed. Um, this is really where you bring all of that together into the concept of a thesis. And I alluded to this in the beginning of, um, I always use the word thesis versus recommendation. The thinking here, at least in, in my view, is recommendation assumes like pretty high confidence that um, you have the assumptions that you need, that the assumptions are vetted, and that you think you can like pretty narrowly triangulate um, a number that you're going to hit. Um, that may be the case if you're taking on, again, like a, a mature program that has a lot of those assumptions hammered out and has a lot of history. Um, in this case, you know, I'm using external benchmarks to do some of these things. Um, we have, you know, only a couple dozen partners. Um, the program is not actively managed. So there's just not a lot of data to go off of. And the idea behind a thesis is you're, you're sort of like a scientist, right? You're saying, here's the data I have. Here's what I think it means. Um, if we do X, Y, Z, here's what I think will happen. Um, so it's really more of like a test and learn approach versus saying like, I have really high confidence that based on these assumptions, we'll do X. Um, and again, you may have high confidence. And in your case, this might need to be a recommendation. Um, in my case, I very intentionally positioned it as a thesis um, to highlight the fact that like we just really don't have a lot of data to go off of here. So the way the thesis is structured is um, here's the data I have. And I think it, that the program is X, right? This is like, I think the program is struggling. I think the program is doing well. Um, I think the program is lagging, underperforming, whatever. Um, you can insert your verb there, and then I believe this is because, you know, fill in the bullet points that um, that justify that conclusion. And then the next statement is, if we do these things, um, the program will succeed, and that is going to be measured by the success that you've defined and the opportunity that you've sized. And it will also be time boxed. So you're saying um, you don't want to leave that limitless. You want to say, like, within six months, I think we can hit that within a year, et cetera. Um, in my case, I had, like, zero confidence forecasting beyond um, beyond a year. So that was the time box for this exercise. And then in order to do all these things, here's the resources you think you need. Um, and then again, going back to the foundational assumption, the last statement here in the thesis is if we don't think that we can invest these resources, then we either A, need to question that the pro whether the program should exist and we need to sunset it, um, or B, we need to redefine success because um, we're not going to have the resources we need to hit success as we've defined it for this um, for this step. So in my case, I'll try not to go into weeds here, but um, the thesis that I developed um, really centered around the idea that we launched the program too early. That was, um, that was a central conclusion I came to, and that was because we had not found product market fit, um, which is kind of a given, right? If you're launching a new product category, you're doing that because there's nascent interest in what you're doing and you're seeing that opportunity. But there are a lot of things that are undefined, and there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to guide agencies in an educated fashion about like what managed service offerings they can sell and build on top of that. Um, if you can't even tell them like what challenges customers are having with your product, um, where there's room to build managed services, all those kinds of things. So um, that was really the central thing that I came to is it, it was too early and we hadn't um, we, we basically launched the program because we, we thought we should, and it sounded like it could be an accelerator, but um, it really just came before its time. There were other things that were more tactical around, like, we just really didn't have go-to-market loops built in. There was no account mapping happening, no understanding of how co-selling would be happening with our team. Um, obviously, the success definition was one thing I've, I've already called out here. And then we didn't have ideal partner profiles. So um, that was that was one of the bigger misses around like when we were onboarding partners, we were kind of taking anybody who would come instead of having a clear sense of like who we thought would be most successful and most engaged in the program. But that was really the central conclusion of the thesis. In terms of like what are the XYZ things we should do, it was refocusing on a on a narrow partner profile building in very clear um, and pretty simple account mapping motions um, to really start understanding where their opportunities were. And then also refining the program tiers. Um, if I'm remembering this right, I think they were based on agency size, which was um, which was kind of arbitrary. Like we had smaller agencies that were very engaged. And even though they had small go-to-market teams, um, they understood our product really, really well. So agency size was not necessarily the best metric for how the tier should be structured. Um, so we restructured some of those. And then probably one of the biggest things, um, for, not, not just for this program, but that um, I've run across at almost any company I've been at is 
the real distinction between whether a program does well or not is the internal alliances that you've built and the internal go-to-market loops. And in this case, um, the organization that I was at was not a partner-led company by any means. And partnerships did not feature, really didn't feature at all in terms of how the go-to-market team um, thought about selling. So that was one area where I probably spent even uh, almost more time than actually like resetting expectations with partners was really trying to understand like, how do we motivate go-to-market teams to understand what we're trying to do here and why it's helpful for them? Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And then in terms of resourcing, um, the goal here was to stay very lean. And it, it's a lot easier to ask for resourcing when your program is throwing off tons of cash and it's easy to just hire more people. But um, in our case, we couldn't say that it was throwing, throwing any kind of cash uh, to the company. So it was basically half of my time that I recommended I spend on it and 30, uh, or sorry, 30, uh, 50% of the solution consultant's time who was helping run the program and about a third of, of my time to help run it. So um, the goal was basically to show like with really lean resourcing, here's what we think we can do. Um, if we're successful at that, then we should reinvest uh, more effort. And if we fail, like we've we've disproved our thesis and we haven't lost um, we haven't lost a lot in doing that, and we can always revisit and decide um, if we need to tweak that thesis and and tweak the recommendation here, um, or if we just sunset the program. So, and then the last statement here again, kind of a throwaway, but if we're unable to do these things, um, we should really consider pausing the program. Uh, the next few steps are um, are really kind of table stakes steps, um, which will seem pretty obvious, but um, getting alignment on the thesis um, is really important. And this is where the state of the union um, is incredibly helpful because almost every time I've presented a state of the union for a partner program, um, I am usually surprised at how surprised other people are um, at like the level of depth that's gone into it. Um, most people tend to not expect um, this level of thought in in like how you evaluate and set expectations for, for a partner program. Um, and maybe that's just, just my experience, but um, it's a really helpful exercise to lay out and give people a sense of like, you know, we've, we've evaluated this in a rigorous way. Um, here's why we think the program failed. Here's where we think we can do better. Um, and again, that might look different if your program is, is already doing really well. Um, but laying out the state of the union and making sure everyone understands and agrees with that assessment is the very first thing you want to do because if you're getting disagreement on somebody saying like, I actually think the program is doing great. Like that's a big red flag that you should all try to realign on before you go further. Um, aligning on success definition and op size um, is obviously pretty important. Um, you'll kind of encounter two things here. At least I, I have where um, people think you're being over optimistic in terms of forecasting, or they think you're being really pessimistic. And so this is where the scenario model is really helpful because you've laid out both, right? And if anyone wants to challenge the assumptions you've made, um, they have basis on which to do that. Um, versus if like you're just throwing out a high level number, um, it's a little harder to have a really informed and productive discussion about why those assumptions are aggressive or like what a different case should look like. Um, but the scenario model anticipates a, lo a lot of this, so it's helpful. Um, at this point, you might actually get disagreement on like, I think the opportunity is too small, or I think you're actually undercounting how big the opportunity is, or um, I think success should be defined differently. So at that point, you want to have like a feedback loop and gather or refine the thesis um, as necessary. And then finally, the last step, um, which I cannot emphasize enough, is the resourcing piece. Um, in our case, again, it was it was really important to agree on this because when the program's flying under the radar, it's very easy to kind of like Get, get an exec shaking their head and saying like, yeah, yeah, like feel free to spend your time on that and you can loop in this other person. But um, at the end of the day, if there's not a, a really clear and explicit buy-in from the team on who's spending time on what, um, you're probably going to find yourself in the very same situation that you, you entered into, which is you're sort of like a lone wolf and nobody else is really thinking about um, what you're trying to do. So um, don't, don't, um, don't assume that, because you've done such a great job laying out the scenario and the thesis that um, people will readily buy in and just contribute their time. Um, this is something you want to get explicit agreement on. And finally, this is um, the execution step. So these are probably the most, um, the most variable depending on the kind of program you're running and how well or not well the program is doing. These are more specific to my situation, but 
one of the things that I wanted to do was um, have an exec sponsor reannounce the fact that um, we were relaunching this and reannounce it to the internal team. Um, and a lot of that was because just going through the state of a union exercise, it became really clear just how little familiarity the go-to-market teams had with partner motions and the partner programs that we had. Um, so coming from me, it would have been really easy to ignore. Like, who is this partnerships guy? We've, you know, we haven't worked with him a lot. Um, why is he telling us what we should be spending our time on versus having that come from a VP or the C-suite where that person is like clearly, you know, that's where, where behavior is really, um, is really driven from the top down. And so if you have an exec saying like, hey, this is important for our team. Here's why. Here's the legwork we've done to understand that. Um, that tends to come off a little bit better in my experience. Um, part of this is also, um, again, what I alluded to earlier, where you will have um, some potential like credibility challenges, especially in a relaunch where people think like, look, we've done this already. It didn't work. Why, like, why are we focusing time on this again? Um, this is where spelling out success and kind of putting yourself on the hook um, is a good way to get over those objections where if people understand really simply, like literally in a sentence or a bullet point, what the program is accountable for from a, a quantitative standpoint, it's much easier to know um, why you're doing it and what it's contributing to the business. Um, so that was really important is um, just being like being accountable, right? Being publicly accountable for um, what you're saying the, the program can do. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I got was actually from, um, it was from a gentleman who was running one of our EMEA sales teams and he had previously run the channel program at Acquia. So one of the strategies that he used um, and that worked pretty well in this case was um, basically creating FOMO for AEs. So in most sales teams, um, at least the ones that I've worked with, you'll have at least like like one to five AEs that just get it. Like they, they've done partnerships before. They understand why partners are valuable and they may not shout it from the rooftops, but in their own sales motions, they will bring in partners when they can. Um, so those are the AEs that you want to try to identify. And when you identify them and they actually drive wins, you socialize those wins. So, and, and that success is theirs. You're not taking credit for that. You're calling out the AE as kind of leading by example and how they worked with a partner to help source a deal or close a deal. And that's really what gets other AEs looking to them and saying like, hey, what's she doing differently that I'm not? That's actually driving her hitting quota or exceeding quota. Um, so this actually worked really well um, in our case in, in the beginning. Um, and again, like especially in a go-to-market team that's just not familiar with partner motions, being able to identify and weed out those folks that really get it and then using them as examples to aspire to is, um, is something that I found is really helpful. And then the last thing I'll hint at, um, which uh, we actually do really well at Ona and is um, one of the reasons why I actually joined the company is um, partnerships has a seat at basically any table where revenue is being discussed. So it's not just like this throwaway line item that no one talks about. Um, if there's weekly exec ops meetings, um, partnerships is in those meetings. If there's rev ops meetings, we're in those meetings. If there's pipeline review meetings, we're in those meetings. So um, basically like getting a seat at the table and just being recognized as like you are expected to contribute to the revenue of the business and you're accountable for that. Um, that is incredibly helpful. Again, especially in this case where um, there's not a lot of buy-in to start with and you're you're kind of jumping in and saying like, hey, like I, I expect this to succeed. Here's the log work I'm doing and I want to report out on it every, um, every week or every couple of weeks. And then there's the, the external relaunch. So um, again, like if, if you're working on a program that's more mature, um, there might not really be like a huge execution step here and certainly not one that you may really have to announce to partners. Um, it may be like steady as she goes and you don't have to do a whole lot, but um, in our case, the program changed pretty substantially. And the, the biggest change um, wasn't actually even the partner tiers. It was the fact that we wanted to realign partners and get them focused on the fact that like we're, we're building go-to-market traction with you. That's really the whole point of doing this. If this is not driving joint revenue opportunities, then like we're both wasting our time. Um, that's probably something some partners expected and wanted, but I think came as a surprise to other partners where they were really more used to at this point, like going through the motions of consuming enablement material, making sure they're familiar with your program, like kind of just knowing how to talk about it with customers, but not necessarily closing the loop on how it translates to, to go to market traction. Um, so that was the biggest thing that we highlighted is letting partners know what it means to succeed in the program. Um, and also getting their take on like, 
what do you think of that change, right? Is this what you're trying to accomplish with the program? For some partners, it wasn't. That, like, that was not the original reason they signed up, um, in which case it's, it's okay to say like, hey, you know what? Like, this, this is not a fit for what we're trying to do now. Um, let's think back in a few months and see what things look like. But in our case, we selected a smaller pilot group of, um, of partners that were excited about the new direction and really did want to be um, more accountable for like a joint partner playbook. And we really kind of focused on the middle tier of the program we defined. The lowest tier of partners was really more focused on just like leveling up on product knowledge and, and really nothing else. Um, the highest tier had already really um, like implemented and ha had a good strategic understanding of how this product category was important for them. That was, that was like a, a huge minority of partners. So uh, most of the meat was in the middle where partners wanted to do that, but they didn't just, they didn't know how. Um, so that's where we, we held their hand a little bit. Um, and then beyond that, um, really just executing on a joint playbook for us, this basically meant, um, well, for one, it meant sharing out the playbook. Um, I've been guilty of this where I'll build out an internal playbook and the partner has like no idea that that's the playbook we're following. Um, so making sure that it's a joint playbook you can expose and follow with the partner in tandem. Um, and then having biweekly reviews. So, um, the, the team before I think met at most like monthly or quarterly with some of these partners. Um, that's a long time to figure out if things are going well um, or if there are misses or opportunities that you're not capturing. So um, we did this, did these every two weeks, um, which I found is generally the right cadence, but you might want to adjust that depending on, on how that goes for you. Um, so that's the execution step. And then there's always the unofficial step of really just hoping and praying, right? Like you've, you've done all this work. Um, you hope that you've been rigorous and thoughtful enough to capture all the context you need to come up with the right recommendation. So um, for anybody who feels like that imposter syndrome feeling of like, I don't think I really know what I'm doing, but I hope people think that I do. Um, you're definitely not alone. Like no matter how rigorous you'll be in this process, um, there will always kind of be that inkling of doubt of like, I really wonder if I've thought of everything or if this is the right path. But again, you have to remember this is a thesis that you're testing. The process is testing and learning. Um, so if you don't get it right out of the gate, um, that's okay, right? You took your best guess and you were really thoughtful about how you approached it, which at a minimum is something that um, I found most people respect, like even if even if you get it wrong. And then just to quickly touch on, um, on the impact for some of the changes that we made. So um, in terms of partner source pipeline, the initial signals were really positive. Um, in the first six weeks, we saw 60K of partner source pipeline which relative to the average deal size for this product category um, was pretty substantial. And the way we did that was through account mapping, right? It was, um, it was just a, a really simple go to market motion that was missing from the program. Um, we didn't contractually obligate anybody to do it, but we basically said like, look, we're, we're measuring you and measuring us off the yardstick of partner source pipeline. Um, account mapping is you know, an easy way for us to understand where joint opportunities are that we can co-sell on. If you don't want to do it, that's okay. But like, just know that we're investing resources in partners that are going to drive towards that success metric. And this is how we think we can drive toward it. Um, so we did have a decent number of partners that were willing to do it. Um, and that was really how those 60K um, in, in partner source pipeline got, um, got sourced. And then probably the most encouraging thing for me was not even the dollars. It was the fact that um, we started to have AEs kind of come out of the woodwork, um, really asking questions about how they could be involved, right? Um, I want to know how we work more with agencies. How do I develop those relationships with agencies um, to source new business? How do I work with the AEs that are doing that so I can get, um, you know, help them close that business? Um, so that was really encouraging and probably like the, the biggest, um, like I said before, the biggest sticking point with trying to get this relaunched is just getting the buy-in from the, the go-to-market team to close those loops. And then finally, we also had um, proactive engagement from the exec sponsor. In our case, that was the VP of solutions, which um, is not necessarily like the ultimate sponsor I would have wanted. It would have been the, the, the chief sales officer, SVP of sales. But um, in our case, like he actually just started to ask questions about how's the program going? Like what's going on with, um, with this partner? So just the fact that he was taking his own time to get more familiar with what we were doing um, is really encouraging. Like that's, that's the best sign of buy-in when um, you're not waiting for a one-on-one -on -one in a month to bring up like what you're doing when someone is just asking you those questions. So really quick to, um, to wrap that up, um, for general takeaways, uh, don't assume the program should exist. Try to validate the opportunity up front. You may not need to make an assumption that drastic, but um, it does help just get a more strategic lens on things. 
Um, don't overcomplicate success. If you can just focus on a single success metric, um, get the full picture before you chase the tactical gaps. Um, those are really tempting to start to, to try to fix, but avoid that temptation if you can. And then position a thesis and test it. Be honest about um, the fact that you don't know what you don't know. And the best you can do is, um, is just test a thesis and, and go from there. And then the fifth point is um, internal alliances are really important. Um, maybe that goes without saying, but I found that they are equally, if not more important than the partnerships that you're building. So don't, um, don't try to rush through that piece if you find that it is a challenge for your, your org or your program. And then finally is ask smart people for help. Um, like I mentioned before, the way that I was able to size the opportunity and define success was by asking people. I hadn't worked on agency programs a lot. Um, we didn't have internal benchmarks that we could go off. So the only way I was able to do this was asking people who were smarter than me, who had done this before. Um, that's what CSA is obviously great for and what we're, what we're doing here. But um, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. You're, there's a 100% there's a chance that you are not the only person dealing with this problem. That's probably why there's, I don't know, what is it, Evan, like 4,000 people in, in CSA now. So um, yeah, don't be shy to ask for help. Thanks, Gene. Man, there's a lot there. Uh, I've got, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt because it was just like, it, I think everybody was kind of like sp sponging out. Um, I mean, I've got a few questions myself, but I'm curious if anybody wants to, we got, uh, what, like 10, 15 minutes here um, to go through some. So does anybody have any questions? All right, I'll ask one and then go from there. Um, the account mapping piece of it, um, obviously I think that's super important. Um, did you, like, what did that process look like? Just, can you just a little bit talk about a little bit, like who you involved internally? Like, were you working with sales, with marketing? Like, um, what, did you use an external tool? Was it was it a CRM um, cost structure? Like, the, was it a big kind of budget buy-in? How did you package that? Yeah, good question. So um, we did not use an external tool. Um, kind of like I mentioned before, it's it's tough to ask for budget for things when um, when you're not making any money. But yeah, we did it very manually, and it was um, the way we positioned it. Essentially, was like we need the partners account list to do the mapping ourselves, and the rationale there was um, just based on our position in the industry. There was a really good chance that like anything we shared over with a partner was going to have like almost a hundred percent overlap just based on where we were at. So um, we really wanted to see it against, um, against our account list and see um, sort of the market segments that they focused on. Um, so that was what we requested. We said, um, can we see your account list? We'll map it on our end and we'll highlight. Um, I think if I'm remembering this right, we'll highlight like 10 opportunities, assuming there even are that many. Cause I think, one of the account maps we had had like 200 customers, which was maybe the, the biggest one, um, meaning 200 customers at, at the top level that we could map overlap against. But for some of them, it was like, maybe there's one or two accounts that mapped over. Um, and the goal was not to focus on like every single one. It was to figure out what are the top 10 and then what are like the top one to three that we can actually go after as quick wins. And for those, the account mapping process, like once we identified them was exchanging some account intel and getting a sense of what was our position with that account? What was their position? Um, what was their position specifically with this product category and where that customer was struggling? So not every overlap had an opportunity associated with it, um, but going through them one by one and really going in depth um, on the account on both sides is what was what was ultimately really helpful and led to the co-selling opportunities um, down the line, but yeah, we didn't we didn't use an internal tool for it. It was just um, it was just a Google Doc, and we, like we had NDAs with um, with each partner and partner agreements, so um, no concern there in terms of, um, or at least minimal concern there in terms of those things leaking. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. You want to kind of just yeah start. I mean, if you if it gets out of control, you can plug some things in. But if they're not, it also goes through the motion of like, are they willing to share that list? Are you are how willing? Are they to work on deals together? Um, getting into those conversations and having a manual look is usually, you know, gets gets that buy-in, and then you can always automate and um, level up. But um, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I'll I'll say really quick there um, what you just mentioned. So the partner's willingness to do that is actually also a really good signal that you should pay attention to because if you have partners that um, are really cagey about doing it or um, are just lazy about doing it. 
that's probably a good signal that you might want to focus time elsewhere. Cause again, like we realign this whole program around go to market traction. This is a really good and obvious way to achieve that. And if your partners are saying like, no, I'm not interested or yeah, like we'll get around to it. Um, that's an implicit signal of like, this is not a priority for them in the way that it is for us. So we need to be spending time elsewhere. Eugene, what would you say, uh, and sorry, I have to jump out to get my help my wife on her tech support. Uh, so I hope maybe you answered this, but what is the, would you say the next biggest risks to level up the program from here? I mean, you conduct on a bunch of risks right at the beginning. So then what's coming next is risks. I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, like short of, um, short of hitting that initial target that you've set, um, is really understanding like growth rate that you should expect. Um, I, so I, I wasn't around long enough um, to get through like the full year cycle of hitting that number and understand what year two or year three looks like. Um, but especially when you're starting from zero and expectations are really low. Um, if you achieve, like if you're successful, that's obviously a good problem to have. But if you're putting up like three figure percentage growth and people expect that in year two, year three, um, you kind of have like, you almost go through this process again on a mini level of justifying the assumptions you're making to get to that growth rate. Um, and it, it may be fully justified and like you hit your number this year and, or you exceeded your number this year and you're going to exceed it next year. But um, if you do really well, like that, that does obviously carry the risk of like, Hey, like you said, this is only going to do X and it actually did Y. And like, we think we can now blow this out of the water in year two. Like you, you need to, you need to temper those expectations in the same way you did the first time around of just taking really like a detached view of how did we succeed this time around? Why do we think we're going to do it again? Like what's changing? Um, so that, that's, that's probably the first one that comes to mind, assuming you're able to navigate all the stuff to getting the number in year one. You know, actually that brings up a really good point that I've been rolling around in my head. We've talked about it before kind of is that there's no real way model well, there may be a way, but there's no, like, here's a one page, an article about how to model and understand partnerships. And so we're trying to convince the business types who are used to direct marketing, you know, MQL, SQL, you know, they don't know how to even think about partnerships. And so at the beginning, setting expectations is hard because even you as a partnership manager may not even know what the expectations are. And that could end up, because, you know, somewhat uncertain or chaotic as it progresses, but that's something maybe as an association we could improve. Cause that's, you know, I'm sure we actually know amongst all of us, like what are reasonable expectations uh, for programs that can write it out and just build like here, just read this three page or this is what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, I, I wish I had that roadmap when I was starting this out, but um, yeah, like you, you do spend, you spend a lot of time triangulating and trying to guess like what normal looks like. Um, and it won't always be like a perfect analogy to your, your business and your industry. But again, like in the spirit of a thesis, it's, um, it's the best you can do. And that's where you start. Eugene, this is Bradley. I joined late, so I apologize if this was addressed earlier. To, but, um, in addition to Sunir's question, how many agencies are a part of your program approximately today or, or after, say, year one? Yeah, we, so um, we, we actually did not, fo this is something that is worth highlighting. We did not focus on, um, on agency growth, like, like growing the partner um, network necessarily. We focused more on activating the existing partners we had. And, and this is kind of what I alluded to in the beginning of um, the part of the pilot was identifying the partners we already had that we thought were the most engaged. And yeah. working with those to show go to market traction versus trying to like replicate a brand new process with brand new partners and just just kind of hoping that worked. So um, the focus was really more on quality, not quantity. Um, the assumption was like if if we prove this out with the existing partners we have, now we have the pipeline foundation that we modeled off of um, to actually go start building the program out. Um, but my assumption was like it's it's too premature to just start sourcing new partners and and pitching a, a program that we really like hadn't tested up to that point. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can totally relate to that. Like even when I was, uh, when I was at Proposify, you know, we scaled an agency program that went from, you know, it was like 10 partners to over 200 in a year, but then we were onboarding every agency that was like, you know, 
yes, we want to be a partner. Here's why. You know, it made sense, but it was never properly qualified with expectations. Um, so very, we scaled it very quickly, but then when we looked at how many were actually active in bringing in one to any cut the amount of customers, it was like 35, 40 out of the 200. So then we were like, okay, like what needs to matter is like, you know, we're going to pause unless it makes a clear, a clear sense and see about activating the ones and then clearing house on the ones that are not. So to your point, when you said kind of setting that kind of, you know, clear expectation of what, you know, what success means in this partnership, um, I think is super critical. Um, like, how, did you, were you, did you have revenue targets? Like, what did you define as that success when talking to a partner? Is it, was it just about, you know, you, like, you, was it as, as far as to go like, okay, if you bring in a customer within the next six weeks, you know, you're going to stick around or was it more like qualitative than that? Yeah. So we, we did not outright say like, here's what we're on the hook for and what we're modeling this program against. Um, what we did say was more of like, it was more of a prioritization lens and resourcing lens of the partners we're going to spend the most time with. And the partners that our field teams are probably most likely to work with are the partners that are driving the most net new business to us. So that's, what's going to be important. And again, like we didn't, we didn't set a hard target because again, newer program, like we, we, we don't have um, a lot of precedent for what is, um, what is normal in terms of what we think the agency would drive, whether it's like a deal a month or a deal a year, right? We didn't, we didn't quite know that. Um, we knew what the assumptions said, but um, more important for me was that the agencies understood like what joint success looked like and that they agreed with that. Um, so kind of like I alluded to before, right? Knowing that that is the standard that you're going to benchmark off of is partner source pipeline. If agencies are telling you like, we're not really interested in account mapping or that's not a priority for us, like right there, right? That's the signal of like, okay, well, you're not going to get a lot of time and attention from us because like that we're, 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 we're maniacally focused on hitting, um, hitting that goal. And we want to work with partners that, that share that vision. Yeah, I think it's great. Like identifying one or two, three of those things where it's like, this is a make or break. Like it's either they, you know, the signal is like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. And they understand the opportunity. And if they don't, it's like, great. Like here's a, maybe, maybe you're, you know, an affiliate partner or something like that, where it's like, you're just looking for a passive kind of recommendation. Um, and sure. Like maybe, maybe, maybe you want to enable them to do that. Uh, but you're not going to dedicate any kind of, you know, zoom time to it, I guess. So, um, yeah, I know. I know we're at time here. The, the one thing I'll leave with is um, this is where having a single like partnership metric is really helpful because um, you don't cloud it for the partner either. Like they're they're very clear on what success means, and there's not a list of ten things that qualify as success. There's a list of one thing, and so um, you get a very clear signal from partners of like, is that important to them or not? And you can at the end of a day or end of a quarter, very easy to measure like were we successful or not because you're you're just focused on one number. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Yeah, no, we're uh, exactly at time here. Uh, Gene, this was excellent. Um, I think there's probably still a few more questions and we can uh, take it to Slack. So if there's anything that you guys um, feel, um, you know, Eugene can, can answer, uh, post it in, in, in the members section of the Slack group and um, we'll go from there. But yeah, thanks for everybody for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll chat soon. For more great insights on partnerships and software, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.